All right, so it's 501. I feel like we have a good amount of attendees to get started. We'll actually get started on, on time today. Um, we've been pretty prompt, but we like to let everyone have an opportunity to join us. So um, a couple of housekeeping things. If you guys are joining us on Zoom, make sure you have the chat box open and you are responding to our questions through there. You can interact with each other through there. And if you have any questions that you want answered, unfortunately, they just zoom by way too fast in the chats for us to catch them. So a way for us to track them and for others to see them is that Q&A box, which is right next to the, your chat box. Um, ask any questions in there and you can actually upvote um, questions in there. So we already have um, some great questions, curious about what software app to, that is best used for virtual estimates, how will this help the cleaning service. So go ahead and open up the Q&A box and you will be good to go. And then if you're on Facebook again, make sure you're reacting, commenting, we're following along there too. So if this is your first, um, if this is your first evening update, Welcome. We do these every day, Monday through Friday at 5 p.m. Pacific time, 8 p.m. Eastern time. So we go over the state of the world as it is according to the home services. Mel goes over the high level things that you should know, anything that has changed since we last met 24 hours ago, the information um, that pertains to you and resources that go along with them. Um, this webcast is open to all home service pros and it's really open for all to join. Um, really anyone who has a small business and anyone who is kind of overwhelmed with everything that's going on in the news like I am. Um, as far as resources, we have supplemental resources for every topic that we go over. They're posted in our blog. We post them in the uh, Coronavirus Discussion Facebook room, group and we also are uploading them into housecallpro.com slash coronavirus. There's a resources section. So um, as always, we encourage comments, engagement, and we ask you to share these in this, uh, this broadcast in this Facebook group and other groups that you're in and get as many pros as you can in here. Let's all share the knowledge. Um, and that's what we aim to do with these special broadcasts every night. That's why we focus on a specific topic, something that's actionable for you to do that day or that week. So without further ado, I will let Mel introduce herself and we'll go into our state of the world. Sure, thanks. Uh, yes, I'm Melina Fairley. I'm the Senior Vice President of People here at House Call Pro. Many of you might call that human resources. Um, feel free to call me Mel. And as a point of introduction, you know, I'm, I'm not a scientist or a reporter. Um, although I might look like one right now. Um, I'm a homeowner. Um, I've got four kids. I'm newly working from, from home during all of this, uh, you know, crazy. And I happen to have 20 years of human resources experience. So I've been giving updates to, you know, my, my team on a daily basis for several weeks now. So bringing this update online is our way of giving back, you know, our way of giving back to the home services. Um, profession and to all small businesses, as Alexa mentioned, it's really something that could benefit anyone who has questions about what's going on in the world and how it might impact business. So tonight, as always, I'd like to give you a brief update on the coronavirus. So every weeknight we come to you live here at the same time. We know that there's more news than any of us possibly have time to digest these days. So the goal here is that at least you know that once a day at the end of your night, or when your night's just beginning, if you're on the West Coast here with us at 5 p.m., you're gonna get a summary from us on the news as we've heard it today. So I'll spend my day collecting all of this information so that you can sit back and just make sure that you get yourself updated. Yep, and we're gonna make sure that we've got the source for all the things that Mel is gonna be talking about. So that way you guys can be sure that the data and the numbers that we're talking about is accurate and verifiable and not just uh, kind of like a copy of paste or some of the memes or hoaxes you guys are seeing out there. Because obviously in times like these, you see a lot of that out there. So um, when we ship out those PDFs to you guys um, and all the things that Mel talks about, they all have sources and she'll mention some of the sources as she's talking. But if you ever want to go take a look at them and, and browse around more, click the links, we've got that for you as well. Yeah, absolutely. And as you join us every night, if there are some things that you think that we're not missing or we're not updating you on, you know, make sure and put that in the comments or post on Facebook, the things that you'd like to hear more about. So every night I start us with a sort of a situation report, the update on the numbers. Um, so the first number is from the World Health Organization. So these are global cases. So the, as of yesterday, the World Health Organization 
reported 372,757 confirmed cases and over 16,000 deaths globally. So those numbers are definitely climbing at a, at a fast rate. Um, here in the US, there are two, two sources of data that I look at every day. One is the CDC and one is Johns Hopkins. The CDC reported over 54,000 cases today and um, over 700 deaths nationwide. So if the global is at 40,000, um, that means the US is about a, a quarter of those? The, yeah, and the new cases for the last 24 hours or so were, were almost 40,000 new global cases. And yes, 10,000 of those um, are in the US. So that makes us about a quarter of the new global cases <laughs> since yesterday. Oh, so. nice. So Johns Hopkins is reporting um, over 55,000 U.S. cases and over 800 deaths, and as a and they update this in interactive real time and interactive map. I think Roland, you showed that map yesterday. So I just checked the interactive map at 4:07 today before I got ready to come sit here with you, and that number had risen to 65,285 confirmed cases and 926 deaths in the US. So you can see just how fast these numbers are rising. Um, so again, I'll, I'll give you these numbers every day, but they're, they're moving targets. Um, yeah, where are we now? Yep. Okay, so hit, you hit the US there, 65, yeah, so, so we see the US here and obviously New York, like you're about to mention here is really hard hit. If you zoom in, you can really dive in county by county level as well. Right, around half of the country's cases, the US cases are in New York. And what we're hearing is that the healthcare system around New York is, is reported to be fairly overwhelmed with hospital, hospitals still seeking masks and other protective equipment, which I know is something that, that our, uh, our viewers right now can empathize with. Mm -hmm. So looking globally, so outside of the US, um, I'll give you a couple of highlights. Um, China has ramped up economic activity after two months of social distancing. So companies there are expected to begin resuming more normal operations, but what we're also hearing is that there are worker shortages as people continue to have some fear of going back to normal or going back to work um, and that that might cause them to come down with the virus or have another outbreak. So as, as much as they're trying to get things back to normal, we're still hearing some shortages of workers. Um, so if we, if we think about that in terms of the U.S., so if we were to lock everything down right now and have it as strict as the Chinese government had it um, with their quarantine methods, we would expect about two week or two months period before we could get back to work. Yeah, I think you had, had been counting days previously, and I think you had a number of 70 some odd 76, days. yeah. Um, so like two and a half months. Currently, one of the things that we do see happening is people sort of marking themselves as to where, where they are in the process as far as like their state you know, it's catching up to Washington or California or New York um, and also looking to, to China. So it is something to keep an eye on. Um, we're, we're seeing other um, countries continue this theme of, of lockdown or, you know, stay at home or shelter at home or pause or whatever folks are calling it. But in Japan and Tokyo, the governor asked residents to avoid non-essential outings um, until April 12th. Uh, we heard that the, the Tokyo Olympics, the 2020 Olympic Games had been um, postponed. And so there's also some concern over what the, the financial impact of that will be. Um, but with postponement, they haven't been canceled. So hopefully that'll, that'll help the financial impact there and things will get rescheduled. Yep, and the impact on the athletes as well that trained four years for that moment. So I guess now they train one more year and if they qualified, they'll, they're still trying to figure out if they're still, if they have to re-qualify to go to the Olympics or if they're going to take the ones that were qualified. Uh, yeah, we've heard- 2021. We've heard that there are athletes that have just been struggling to get their workouts in, to get trained. So it, it sounds like it was a good decision um, for everyone. So more, more to yep. come. Um, yesterday, I reported that India had started a 21 day lockdown for you know, 1.3 billion, billion people. They have updated what that really meant. Yesterday it was sort of unclear. So it seems to be following along the lines of what we're seeing in the US, like grocery stores and banks are open, home deliveries encouraged, but anything social um, you know, is, and big gatherings are, are prohibited. So it seems to be a common theme across the world. Um, we also saw today the first, um, Navy ship 
um, cases, the Roosevelt, one of the largest ships in the Navy with 5,000 folks aboard, are three infected sailors that are being quarantined and flown off the ship. So I can imagine with those tight conditions that that's got to be something that we're keeping a really close eye on with everyone else on board. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the economic impact on all of this. Yeah, I mean, certainly there is one. I think everybody here that's tuning in tonight is asking about themselves and their families and their business. The economic impact is, is far and wide. Um, yesterday, we heard President Trump express a desire to see you know, churches full by Easter, which is April 12th, but we've also heard Dr. Fauci, the director of the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease, saying that it looks like we've got to you know, hold that decision and make the decision in the future based on the evidence and trends at that time. And what we also know is that all of these decisions as far as what businesses are open, what are closed, what is social distancing in each area has been local decisions. So we're seeing state governors and cities making lots of those decisions. So it's really, yep. it's really something that's moving quickly, changing every day and also differs depending on where you are, as far as what you are and are not allowed to do these days. And so state by state, there's different different things being implemented. Um, what's been the impact to California in terms of um, impact? Yeah, I mean, we are obviously a, a large state. And right now, we've already seen a surge in unemployment benefits. Over 1 million people in California filed for unemployment this month alone. And we're also seeing layoffs, um, salary reductions, furloughs. I'm sure this is a common theme um, that that lots of our home service you know providers are seeing as well. So, government is working on it, <laughs> working on some some relief. So the the Senate might vote as e as early as this evening on. You've probably heard about this, you know, two trillion dollar emergency relief package. So we're all waiting. I maybe it'll be taking place while we're here together. Um, so. We're seeing that the Senate leaders are having a few last minute snags and hurdles as they try to get through the fine print. But here are the things that seem to be coming up within the bill, um, $1,200 to most Americans and $500 to most kids. So direct payment of money into the pockets of, of you know, most of the folks here in the country. And also lending program for businesses, cities and states, of course, money to hospitals and then one you know, provision that it seems like they're, they're debating a, a good amount right now is also um, providing up to four months of unemployment insurance, um, which would be a, a really substantial contribution from, from the federal government. And this is on top of state, right? Right, so we talked about unemployment as one of our past topics and unemployment, is our, unemployment insurance are state run programs and they differ state to state. They differ in how much you get per week how many weeks you're eligible. So what they've been talking about in the Senate is proposing adding federal funds that would go on top of whatever your state is doing. Um, and what we heard this morning, we woke up to a number of about $600 per week. So that, as I understand it, is what, what they're still debating on and what we're, we're looking to get further clarity on as this um, bill continues to, to progress. If you had a guess, do you think it'll end up at 600 or will it end up at more or less? I, I doubt it would be more. I think their their debate right now is that that you know might be providing incentive for you know companies to lay off people because it's it could be particularly thought of as as generous. So um, I know workers are hurting. I know there are a lot of folks applying for unemployment. So I've certainly got my fingers crossed that that number stays as high as possible. Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, when does it pass the Senate? Um, so does it become law right away? How long does it take to get into effect? Because I know a lot of our pros here are probably wondering like, okay, right. when this does pass, like how does this affect me tomorrow? You know, how does this affect me on Monday? So what are we, what are we seeing or thinking um, uh, based upon that? Yeah, great question. There's actually one more step after the Senate. Um, the next step is a little less clear. So it would need to go to the House and the House is out of session. So action there could take a little bit longer. So they're, they're literally trying to figure out if they would agree to just have it be passed by unanimous consent, you know, as opposed to showing up in person and doing a, you know, person by person vote. So hopefully tonight will be a big news e evening and we'll hear that the federal stimulus bill has passed the Senate and we'll hear, hear details on how it's going to be handled in the House and, you know, all 
if all things go well, we'll keep you posted and hope to be able to report on, on that good news tomorrow. Awesome. All right. Well, well, we'll stay tuned. I feel like it was 1030 last night that we learned, um, you know, what happened. Well, yeah, I guess it was 130 um, a.m. Eastern time. So <laughs> be glued to our TVs. Well, thank you, Mel, for, for our evening update. Our goal is to bring you more information on this tomorrow. Like Mel said, she's watching it very closely, her and her team are, to bring you the most up-to-date information um, and make it digestible and understand how it applies to you. And I know that um, this is like a hot topic right now and everyone wants more information on it. So we're trying our best to get you the best sources and resources here. So we hope that tomorrow's topic will be on this and we can bring you some more information. Um, but we don't want to bring you any wrong or underdeveloped information at the same time too. So just keep that in mind as you're asking us questions about it. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to get into the topic for this evening. Thank you, Mel. She's going to cut her video and um, maybe come back on later for Q&A if she's still there. Um, so we will see her. So um, we are really excited to talk about today's topic and it's really how to start offering virtual estimates. Um, we asked in a poll earlier today, how many of you have done virtual estimates always, sometimes never want to do it, don't think I can do it. And we had a whole slew of answers. And so our goal by the end of this um, webcast is you have actionable steps and a resource on how to start doing these virtual estimates and how to start offering them to your customers. And our guest, Zach, who's going to be coming on here shortly, um, is actually going to do a live demo of one for you and how he does it and give you all of his little golden nuggets of information to help you start providing virtual estimates for your customers. So um, like we were talking about before, many pros have been really successful conducting virtual estimates even before the coronavirus came around. Um, it's going to take some practice to get used to, but um, at the end of the day, this is what we're going to be moving towards. It's what is acceptable right now and is and what is required to make everyone involved feel comfortable. Um, it also positions you as like a technologically savvy and forward company. So that's another reason why you should absolutely be getting behind this whole touchless operation system. And so with these, um, with these lives and with these webcasts, we hope to equip you with the tools and knowledge to help you start doing that. So we're going to run you through six um, of our biggest findings from talking with pros in the coronavirus group. We're talking with pros in our own group about virtual estimates. So Roland, why don't you start us off? Yeah, obviously there's there's two ways that this can be used. One is obviously virtual estimates. Um, the one is actually you can do a service through the phone. So we're going to be focusing more on the virtual estimate. And uh, the focus of that is to figure out how can we generate a lead from this that can turn into future potential business? The other way is more like a telemedicine or um, you know, a, a pay by the minute or pay by the service kind of diagnostic fee that you literally would run um, face to face, um, but now transforming it into FaceTime to FaceTime or Zoom to Zoom or WhatsApp to WhatsApp, whatever it happens to be. So we're gonna focus more on the virtual estimate side, which is just generating leads and generating goodwill with your customers and then giving them a quote or some kind of um, um, estimate on on what they would be paying. So um, from that perspective, um, there's all kinds of different um, businesses that can use this. Um, don't think like, oh, I'm not um, you know, a painter, or I'm not a this, and I can't provide this estimate through here. Um, this is actually gonna be a really cool practice that would set your business apart. This is something really cool that you can go market out there saying, hey, now offering virtual estimates. Um, a lot of people say like free estimates, and that's what they used to, and they go drive around and spend a lot of dollars going um, around um, doing bids, um, but now this will, will be seen as like really tech forward, um, safe for the family, um, as well as it's gonna save you some time. You're gonna be able to do more of these um, with, with less work and less, less overhead. So when you're thinking about what types of jobs can be estimated easily, um, think about things where, you know, is it, is it easy for the homeowner to access themselves? You know, do they have to crawl in a crawl space? Hopefully not. Um, can they just walk around their home? Can they point the phone at, you know, the dishwasher? Or can they point the phone um, around the home to estimate like the size of it? So think about what jobs are easy for the homeowner to access that you actually need to visually be able to see. Obviously, um, a lot of people are used to already quoting people through the phone and running through a script of questions to identify roughly what it might or might not be. But think about the things that are easy for the homeowner to go find, um, things that you can see pretty easily through the phone. So they're not literally like taking their phone and like, you know, <laughs> putting it like right up against the thing and 
and this isn't working so well because I got the virtual background here, but um, just keep those things in mind. Um, I would even list out what are your most common services that you offer and figure out which ones and just go checkbox. Yep, I can probably estimate this right 90% of the time. Remember, you don't have to be 100% accurate. It's totally fine to tell your customer like, hey, I'm going to give you a range from this cost to this cost. Or you're going to say, hey, this is going to cost up to, or it's going to cost starting at this, and it might be a little bit more. Um, but that way you can give um, a number to them that they can start to wrap their, their mind around. Mm -hmm. And the next step here is assessing how you can perform these estimates virtually. This is on your end. So right now, virtual estimates, they can be conducted through the phone or a video call. Um, we've even seen some pros doing it through email or through um, an online form or online booking. That still counts as virtual. But what we're really challenging you to do here is a face-to-face -face, um, virtual appointment, as um, Donnie said, kind of like a virtual appointment. That's exactly mm -hmm. what this is, a virtual estimate. So um, figuring out what um, what you need on your end. So that has to do with the platform that you decide to do it on. So um, the call that we're on with you right now, it's through Zoom. And we there's free versions of Zoom and there's very cheap paid versions. We have a more expensive one because we host these bigger webinars. So um, Zoom would be a platform that we suggest. Also FaceTime or um, Facebook Messenger also has a way for you to do um, a, a video message together because some people have Android, some people have iPhone. That's probably a question you'll want to ask your customer before you hop on a virtual um, before you hop on a virtual um, estimate. But for us, Zoom works really well. That's what we use for all of our meetings, um, and it's free. And the even the paid versions are pretty cheap. So there's a lot of the stuff. Free, the free is going to take you really long, guys, or it's going to take you a really long way. Yeah. Um, you can do pretty much however many one-to-one -one meetings. The only real limit is that you can't do a meeting longer than 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. I hope you guys aren't doing virtual estimates that are lasting longer than 40 minutes yeah. because <laughs> that would probably be counterproductive. Yeah, um, definitely. Some other, some other platforms, Skype, which is also free, and Google Hangouts is another really good option if you have Gmail. All of these are really easy to send to your customers and send them links. Um, it's Google all, Duo like, too, yeah. Yeah, Google Duo. That's also like a... It, I don't, on, on like the customer end, I would be all about that because everything we do now is digital anyway. I FaceTime my friends, I FaceTime my family. This is not something that you should just be doing for this time period. It's something that you should be implementing for, for the long run. So um, choosing what platform you're using, that's your next step. And then um, Roland. Yeah, so choosing your platform um, you want to make a list of kind of common estimate pitfalls here. So think about what things um, that you catch in person um, versus what might be difficult um, via having someone walk their phone around. So what are some things that you may or may not be able to see? Um, just think about what might be some of the gotchas or think about things that could incur like a higher cost on your end because you don't want to misquote a customer um, too far off. So make sure either um, that you can see the, this critical element or if you can't, just make sure that you let your customer know um, and set the expectations correctly before beforehand saying, hey, this is um, what I think it's going to cost. I wasn't able to see this one thing in the attic because you couldn't get up there. It was too hard. Um, typically, it's between here and here, but just so you can um, at least prepare and set the expectations correctly. So if they do accept it, when you come out and do it, there's no surprises. Absolutely. So, so, um, so, okay, so this is the next thing, um, step five here. <clears throat> um, you know, you should let your customer know what they'll need to do for the estimate. So um, oftentimes what is an easy way to do this is if you're using House Call Pro, you can send an email um, before an estimate or before a job. Um, you can also just create a little quick flyer or one cheater or one pager and shoot it to them via text or send it to them via email um, that explains um, how to expect um, and what to, or sorry, what we'll to expect, what to expect during this virtual estimate process. Um, are they going to be walking outside? You know, tell them, hey, it typically takes five to 10 minutes set expectations um, around their time. So they know how much time they're going to invest in it. So it doesn't seem kind of open-ended. The more that you do uh, in this process really helps set the stage uh, for your customer 
Um, so that way they feel like, oh, Roland always does this or Alexa always does this, you know. Um, this way, it seems very natural for them and it seems structured. And if you just write a couple bulleted points um, down, you can go, hey, let's go do step one. Hey, let's go walk over here. Now step two. Okay, now at the end of this, give me one second here. Let me just walk you through this. Boom, here's the price. Um, so that way it's very structured. Um, the customer knows exactly what to expect. And that way too, um, once you do them, you're gonna want your technicians to do it as well. So by doing this, you're forcing everyone good to go through the same process so you get to the same results. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, sending the estimate via email or text, that's your last touchless point. Also taking payment over via email, your customer can enter in their credit card information and pay you that way. Um, so after you've completed the call, you can send them to your digital estimate. Um, one thing that I want to know about this entire process. So we have this all written out for you, um, in a blog post, we'll be linking it here. Um, this is review this is a review worthy estimate. Some of the best reviews that we read when pros share them on our page is that a customer is, is complimenting them and reviewing them on the entire booking process from before they even meet the pro, before they meet the tech, before the work is done. When you can take them through a beginning to end virtual experience and touchless experience, especially through a time like this, um, implementing all the things we've been teaching you guys about how to have them sit in the other room while the service is being performed, all the touchless um, items to perform the job while you're there, in addition to them being able to book virtually with you and pay virtually, that is a review worthy experience. And that's something that makes you stick out. So just keep that in mind as you are acclimating yourself to this, this is going to pay off in, in the long run. So um, I want to bring on our pro guest, Zach. Um, Zach, go ahead and unmute yourself and start your video. <clears throat> Hi, how are awesome. you? All right. Zach. <laughs> hey, Roland, how are you doing? Yeah, good. So um, I somehow okay. just lost. Zach, no. me how many points you have um so far and how you've been adapting yeah so what alexa so, said is give give the intro or maybe it was yeah. my 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 zoom here that was running slow yeah i don't i don't know what just happened to hers but there we go okay so um real quick i just want to say hi to everybody that's out there i want to thank uh house call for giving me this opportunity to come in and talk to you all um virtual estimates are something i've been doing for a long time so first um i'm zach my name um, zach ventresca i am the owner of the Window Gang Austin franchise. We're a window cleaning pressure washing company here in, in Austin, Texas. Um, so I own this franchise and have for about uh, just over five years. And in January, I became the CEO of the franchise system. So I'm running the whole franchise system now. Um, we have, I'm, I'm ballparking, but about 175 franchises throughout the country. Um, some of them are corporately operated. The majority of them are independently owned. Um, so this is this is something that that means a lot to me because i have a lot of people working for me um right now uh, working for me working for the owners and we however you want to look at it but we have a lot of people that are being affected by this um right now i don't even want to guess at how many employees um that the system has but i have i have about 70 owners um a lot of them own more than one franchise and, and then we have also we have corporately operated outlets so we're talking about a lot of people um that the, the decisions that, that I'm making right now are affecting, and a lot of them come down to things like virtual estimates. So this is a, this is a, big, a big item for me that I care a lot about. Um, so a brief, and I'll keep it as brief as possible, brief history of how I got started doing virtual estimates is when I first bought Window Gang Austin, the, the Austin franchise back in early 2015, um, I was, I was in the army. I was active duty army. Um, and I bought a struggling and, and failing franchise and I had about 10 hours a day that I had to do army stuff. And I had 14 hours a day that I could spend doing <laughs> window gang stuff, um, which was a bit of a nightmare. So at the time we were pen and paper business. We didn't have house call yet. We didn't have any software. Um, everything was done literally on carbon forms. Um, and that was, that was a big problem because I was not at the office, I was at the army. Um, so one of the first things I did is implemented the software and it, it ended up being House Call Pro. It, it took me a couple of tries to find House Call Pro. 
Um, but I did, and it was, it was kind of middle of 2015 when, when I became a house call pro um, company. And, and we haven't looked back. Um, we're now rolling out House Call Pro. Since I became the CEO for Window Gang, we're rolling out House Call Pro for, for every franchise that we have. We're in the process of that right now. Um, and it's, so far, it's going very, very well. So that's kind of where um, I came from. That's kind of how we got started in this. And I realized quickly that I couldn't do all of the estimates that I needed to do in the couple of hours a day that I, of daylight that I had after I did all of my army stuff. Um, it was just impossible. So we, I quickly started, and, and not all the ideas worked, I quickly started trying to come up with ways of, of doing estimates either virtually or automatically um, and, and having my techs do them. Because previous to, to this effort, it was only the owner. The previous owner did all of the estimates and he was really, I don't know if you guys have ever been to Austin, Texas, but we have horrible traffic. Um, and it just became a huge time suck on yeah. the previous and, owner. and I really hadn't, you know, I mean, our traffic is, is nearly as bad as LA. I'm from Southern California, so I know what you guys deal with there in, in Southern Cal. And uh, it's, it's pretty bad out here, even compared to mm -hmm. like LA. So mm -hmm. that's where this started. Um, we started doing what I, the way I currently do the virtual estimates um, or online estimates. Um, we do, we're kind of a hybrid system of online and virtual. Uh, we started doing them the way we do them now about three years ago. Um, we're going to walk through some of them at the end, but one of the things they wanted me to touch on is what not to do during a virtual estimate. And Roland has already hit on, and we did not compare notes before this, but Roland has really <laughs> already hit on the things that, uh, that I was going to, that I was going to talk about. Um, it's really, really important that your, your virtual estimation process is a process. It can't be a guess. You have to do this the same way for every service for every customer that you do this for. You really can't guess. It has to be repeatable and it has to be explainable. When the customer says, well, how did you come up with this price? You have to have something to base it on. Um, so I really can't stress enough that it can't, it can't just be a guess. It has to be a process. And there's a lot of ways of thinking about it. And we'll talk about a couple of them here in a minute when we go through the, the demo. But you really, it needs to be a process and it needs to be a simple process. So hopefully in the future, it doesn't have to be you that does it. it sh this should be very, very simple. I right now have done hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of estimates that we have closed through this process. And most of them have been done through a call center. Like I have a call center doing most of my virtual estimates. That's not gonna be the case, right? In all of these services, but a lot of them, it's simple enough that people I have never met are pricing these services from my customers. And we are, we are within 90% of the actual yeah, it has to be has to be scalable and repeatable because it's, if it's not those things and this is not going to work beyond yourself really so work. make sure you're thinking about it from a from a systems-based approach yep and then the other thing i really wanted to hit on um that we had a little bit of an issue with at the beginning is same concept right is, is be confident but cautious and don't make promises on the price you have to make sure that the that the customer realizes this price is based on what i was just able to see in the pictures you sent me or what I was just able to see in the video walk around your house we just did, there are going to be potential hurdles that we have to overcome that there is no chance that we were able to get in those pictures and those photos. Um, one, of the, the, one of the demos of the complicated demos we're gonna do here in a minute is a roof wash. And there are so many things that could go wrong and so many things you have to look at that there are times that we're not able to do, they're rare, but there are times that we're not able to do like a roof wash through a virtual estimate. Um, it's really important too that you're able to though to repeat and scale the process because you, you don't wanna get accused of baiting and switching, right? Don't tell yep. them, hey, it's gonna be a hundred bucks and get out there and it's six, right? If you tell somebody it's gonna be a hundred bucks, you get out there, it's 105, no one cares. Um, it's even better if you can get out there and tell them it's 95, you know, then everybody's really happy, but don't get out there and, and double, triple, quadruple the price or it's just not gonna, it's never gonna work. Um, the results that we see from doing virtual estimates um, is, is the biggest result that I saw as a, as a local franchise owner, this is well before um, I became the CEO of Window Gang, um, is I was able to actually run the company. Um, like this was, this, was a, this was a make it or break it deal for me. Like it was, it was impossible. Um, I just retired from the army back in September of last year. So for almost four years, uh, for right at four years, I did both of these things full time. And there is, and I was able to triple the size of the franchise in, during that time. And I spent 
nine hours a day at my army job, not at my franchise. So this was, this was enabled that to happen. Um, substantially less time is spent on estimates. There's substantially fewer phone calls. If you, if you really dial your process down, you can spend substantially less time or whoever is on your phone can spend substantially less time on the phone. Um, a lot fewer miles, right? Less gas, less mileage, less vehicles, less people um, on the roads. So less expenses to get all of this done. Let me, um, let me ask you this. Let me yeah. ask you this, Zach, real quick. Um, so how many customers, when you say, hey, we're going to do like a virtual estimate for you, how many of them give pushback and they're like, no, you have to come to the home. Like, how do you handle that objection? Because I feel like all of our pros, regardless of the industry, um, probably have some angst and fear around that. Yeah. So here I did too. Um, and every, and, and a lot of my franchisees still do. Um, and here's what I'm going to tell you about your angst and fear. It is yours. It is not your customers. Um, realize that most people in 2020 that have money to spend are willing to do so in a virtual environment and online. Um, you, you can't walk up to a ticket counter and buy an airline ticket anymore. You, you, there are so many things that are going online. That, that, net, that five years ago, no one thought it was possible that are going online that, that are 100% that are now entrenched online. And you can't imagine doing it any other way. Five years ago, people were saying this could never happen. Um, what I was about to hit is, so, so one, the way we answer that is, is this is our method. Um, this is how we do it. If, if you're truly un so uncomfortable that you're not willing to do that, then you should probably find a different service provider. Um, and that is an extreme... That is an extreme viewpoint. I realize that, but that is that is the situation that we've been in for years. Um, and it is again, we have we we tripled before I retired from the army, and we have we have almost doubled from there in the last year. So it sounds uh, like um, the customers that are not willing to go through it might not even be the customers worth going after at this point. Exactly, they are truly not. And then the other thing to think about. So, and, and while I don't want to, I don't want to. Right, like there are going to be somebody's grandmother is not going to be okay with a virtual call, right? Like, and, and I don't want to make light of that. I don't want to say don't service your grandmother's house because she doesn't know how to use FaceTime. That's not mm -hmm. what I'm saying. But realize that the flip side of that is just as true. I have in my house, I am generally everybody's target demographic. I make really good money. Um, I live in a nice gated community in a big house. I have, I have two kids, a wife, two dogs, right? We have, and we outsource everything. I run three companies um, and everything is outsourced in my life, right? So I have a lawn service that I've never met. I have a pest control service I've never met. I have a lawn, right? Like a lawn treatment company I've never met. Um, we have a house cleaner that I've only met once. And um, we have a guy that comes and picks up my dog poop and I've never met them, right? Awesome. So the flip side of the 85 year old grandma who will only deal with you in person is a huge market of people that do not want to meet you. I don't, I don't have time to take five phone calls to figure out how much it's going to cost to get my yard mode. I'm going to go, I'm going to, if I have to pay an extra five bucks a week to not talk to you five times, I'm going to pay the extra five bucks a week. I don't want to deal with people. And I know that kind of goes against the whole relationship marketing thing that a lot of people preach and relationship marketing is important when your customer wants a relationship with you. But there are so many people that I don't want to know the guy delivering my pizza. That's why I use the Domino's app, right? <laughs> like, I don't, I don't care. Um, and there are, there are huge and growing numbers of people that are more interested in doing business with my franchise because you can do it all online and virtually, and you don't have to show up at home for me to be there to meet you and shake your hand and pass Corona around. Yeah, it's probably probably like um, there's a strong correlation between people that provide inside home services versus exterior because the exterior, like you just mentioned, if I don't have to be home uh, when you're doing your services, I don't like do whatever you want to do. I, you know, come whenever right. you want. I just want it absolutely. done and I'll pay you for absolutely. it. Yeah, and there is there is absolutely a difference to that. We do um, we're able to quote most of our interior services that we do the same way. Um, all of the interior services that we do the same way. A lot of those are also flat rate, um, which, you know, so, so virtual estimates for flat rate service are, are kind of less important. Um, but there's a lot of people that prefer to do the virtual, the virtual method. Um, so that is most of what um, they asked me to cover. Roland, do you have anything else you want me to yeah. cover for jumping in this demo? No, I would just say like, I think um, a lot of our pros, people watching are just really curious on how to get started. And obviously like, 
um, there's two modes and I covered this earlier. One is, hey, can you actually quote a real time price um, over the phone and then you go do the service and then get paid afterwards. Um, another mode is, you know, can you actually do a diagnostic or offer your services through the phone and charge for it while you're doing it, right? Lending your expertise is more like a teledoc, right? Or like, a, I don't know, talk to this like Headspace or like or one of those ones where you can talk to like psychiatrists online. So yeah. there's kind of like two modes. And this is really like lead gen establishing a quote and really sinking your hooks in deep with that customer so you can actually go out and close and win that job. Um, so I'd be really curious how that script goes kind of from, like the, the beginning um, to then actually go doing that demo. So um, that's yeah, perfect so way to transition. Me, okay, yeah, so I have a, let me pull up one additional thing that I didn't plan on, but it just take me a second. Um, and do I have the ability to share my screen? Alexa? Yep, you should at the bottom bar. Do you have a green oh, share screen? Yep, it cool. is green. Yeah, it wasn't earlier, but it is now. Awesome. Um, Okay, so this is not what we are currently using, but this is a this is a very rudimentary spreadsheet that we threw together quickly. Um, so one of the things that we have found that we are able to do is we're able to. Sorry, can you guys see my screen? Should yeah, be. Yep. Be okay. Um, so really, the way this works, um, and this is something I actually developed going through and talking to House Call Pro engineers about a custom software build that we're in the middle of, um, is is you, we have packages up here, and if you put in, we use something very similar to this spreadsheet for all of our calls, and this is what the call center does. So if you have a twenty five hundred square foot house, we're able to generate these numbers. Um, and I don't let me make sure you guys can let me zoom in a little bit. I'll make mm -hmm. sure you guys can. Whoa, not that. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> That's okay. great. See much yep. of that? Okay. Yep. So these, these prices are generated based on square footage pricing, right? So I don't, we're not going to bother talking about um, the multiples that I use because they're going to be different from my business to your business. They're going to be different from the fact that I'm in Austin, Texas, and I generally only service gated communities to the fact that you're in rural Nebraska and you guys don't have communities. I, I don't write like, so the multiples you have to figure out based on your actual pricing, but we're, we price based on the size of a house. And this gets, um, it gets very specific. It gets very detailed. And then, and then we make it a range, right? So if you're in this particular 2,500 square feet, we're going to quote $150 for gutter cleaning. So we're going to quote 125 to $175 for gutter cleaning. I don't even know what we're multiplying it by in this particular spreadsheet, but whatever it is that you pick, right? Break it down to either size of the house for cleaning companies. I worked with, I was coaching a cleaning company the other day and we were able to, um, we were able to base their pricing on two different ways and they, and they picked one and they, we were able to base their pricing on square footage or number of bedrooms because a, a house with a certain number of bedrooms generally has a certain number of common areas. Again, we're going on averages and it's really important that you, that you let your customers know, like based on the fact that you have four bedrooms and five bathrooms, we are going to extrapolate that price to $800 or whatever it is that you do it. And it's really important that this is based on actual numbers. So when we were developing the numbers that we're currently using, I took several years of previous data where we had window counts and gutter measurements and all of this stuff and square footage of these houses. And we put it all into a big data spreadsheet and we were able to get averages, pull averages out of that. And when I say a bunch, I'm talking about, I took 6,000 in-person estimates and converted them into a spreadsheet. And we were able, I'm a data nerd. And, and so if you're not like find one, somebody who is, mm -hmm. but, it, we took, I took almost 6,000 estimates and put them onto a spreadsheet and extrapolated out data and on a scatter chart. And we're able to take within one, now we're, we're getting really nerdy now. So within, within, within plus or minus 10%, let's say it that way, um, we were able to get a price based on square footage for our services. That is plus or minus 10% with, with ignoring a, an outlier here or there. So yep. that is what, that is the concept that went into the spreadsheet you have in front of you. And so that's how, that's how we did this. And you can see the chimney sweeping and the driving cleaning, those are flat rates, those don't change. Solar panel cleaning is $8 a panel. Um, you can usually count panels and the method we're gonna go into in a minute. 
Um, so when, for the services, we can go virtually like this, so go online like this. This usually happens on a phone call or very soon will happen in an embedded software that we're gonna have on our website. Mm -hmm. um, but this is how we come up with the pricing for the individual services. Cool. Uh, it's based on the size of the house. So then if we move into services that we can't book online, so real quick disclaimer, I have no idea this house you're looking at here in Leander, Texas, this is just, this is not a customer. I have no idea whose house this is. Please don't show up at their house and knock on the door. It's not my house. <laughs> just a house I picked off of Zillow because it's simple. Yeah. Um, so the first thing we do is we get the address right and we Google the address and we come up, if you look at Zillow, a lot of this comes up integrated into House Call Pro but we want the photos. We want the ability to see more pictures if we're doing a roof wash for these guys. Um, so we Google the address, we bring up Zillow, we can see their square footage right here on the top. Um, and then we can see pictures of their house. For these guys, this is all pretty common, right? You don't get a lot of pictures of the outside of the house on Zillow. Um, so we usually have to move into something else. So we come into Google Maps and what we're looking for in a, on a roof wash, right? Is, is it gonna be safe to clean that roof how are we going to, how are we going to do it? Do we need ropes and harnesses and anchor points or can we clean it from a ladder, right? I mean, most people realize that a roof wash is basically spraying a chemical mixture onto a roof and letting it work and then rinsing it off. Um, so that's what we're looking for in this house. So this house on street view, sorry, on uh, Google maps, we can see this is a pretty simple one story, low pitch roof house. We're going to be able to perform a uh, hold on one sec zach we're getting some comments saying that we can't um see your screen oh hmm let's see what can my you see my screen i can see it yeah i can see your screen too yeah see um, other people say i can too oh wait here we go who is <clears throat> sharing ones I can see in here. Yeah, I think for people that can't see, you might have um, just moved off the screen and just looked at our faces rather than the screen and the faces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see screen. I can see okay. screen now. They can't. So we're good. We're in a good spot. Go ahead and reshare. Okay. Zach, reshare. Yeah, you can reshare. So, right. So what we what we're able to look for. So if we get if these people call us and they want an estimate for a roof wash. Um, what we're looking for is, is this a simple roof wash? Can this, is this something we can give them a price based on the, the surface area of the roof? In this case, it would be, right? Like we're gonna be able to spray this entire thing from a ladder. We're not gonna have to walk around on a roof. We don't need, we don't, there's, there's not a lot of safety concerns. I mean, there are, but there's, there's not a lot of, there, there aren't a lot of surprises on a house like this. Can you reshare, so, reshare again, Zach? Can I reshare, of course. Yeah, so we can see the roof because having the visual is awesome. I'm sorry. Um, it, or was I not sharing the roof? Uh, oh, you were, and then we it turned off. Now, oh, we're, now, we're, now we're back. Again. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I didn't realize it turned off. Um, <laughs> so right again, like this is this is one that we're going to be able to do virtually. We're going to be able to do this all over the phone, looking at this and a couple of other photos. Right. So we look at this, then we're going to look at Street View. We're going to see the pitch of the roof. We're gonna we're going to be able to judge on a one story house. This this size. This is what two thousand square feet. Twenty yep, thirty thousand. Um, you know, we're going to be able to, knowing our equipment, knowing what we know about our, our equipment and the way we clean, we're going to be able to do this without getting on the roof, which means we're going to be able to avoid almost all of the safety equipment. Um, like this is a very simple and safe house to do a roof wash on. So what we're going to do from there is we're going to move into Google Earth and Google Earth Pro. Can you guys see this screen now? Yep. Yep. Um, Google Earth Pro is a free program from Google. Um, we have, there are other programs that cost a lot of money um, that for made primarily for roofing companies that do a lot of things automatically. Um, we are going to avoid all of that expense by using Google Earth Pro. Um, Google Earth Pro allows you to do some really cool stuff. Um, let me adjust just a little bit. So this is the house in, in question. So Google Earth Pro, we can draw what's a polygon on top of it. And we can talk about all this stuff in more detail later and I'll be able to answer questions for people. But we can do, we can go like this and we now have a polygon of approximate area of 2,600 and 2,700 square feet. So if you charge 25 cents, let's just pick an easy number. We go 2,700 times 25 cents for a roof wash. You're looking at a roof wash price of six seventy five. So we quote that anywhere from six twenty five to seven fifty, or six fifty to seven fifty, and that is going to cover all of the the possible issues that we run into on a, on a simple roof that size. If we very cool. 
Yeah. Yeah, however, real quick, if we contrast that with a roof like this, this is a whole other thing. Wow. This is one of the ones. Is that um, a resort? We're just, we're just quite <laughs> simply not going to be able to give them. I mean, we will give them a price. Like right now in the middle of the coronavirus, in order to, to get this job locked down for when we're able to do it, we'll give them a price, but the range is going to be huge. Like this, just being realistic. That I know for a fact that because I know where this house is and I, I know the area, this house is built on the side of a cliff. Um, we are going to have a lot of difficulty getting to the house. It's a tile roof house and we're not going to be able to get it all from a ladder. Like we're going to have to walk around on this roof. So that brings in all sorts of issues that we're going to have to be in person to accurately, to accurately measure. How do we write all the OSHA issues, all the safety issues, all the just what happens if we break a tile walking around this roof? So this is the exact opposite of that, of that simple house that we just talked about. This is one we can absolutely get the size of it, but it's not something that a flat, that a flat 25 cents or 35 cents or dollar a square foot is necessarily going to cover. This house, I have actually been to this house. This house we were looking at doing a roof wash was going to involve a lift rental and there was no way to know that until we got there. So there are limitations to virtual estimates. Um, so realize where those limitations are. For us, it has a lot to do for with roof washing. It, it has a lot to do with tile roofs. Um, metal roofs, people get scared about a lot, but there's actually some really cost effective anchors that make metal roofs very easy to work on. Um, tile roof is a whole other thing. Um, so for us, if this house comes up and wants an estimate for roof wash, like there's really, I, I wish I could tell you that I had a great solution for this and I, I don't. Like there are limitations. So, okay, so if this was my house, Zach, and I said, hey, Zach, you know what? Can you give me a quote? Um, what would you tell me? Like we hop on the phone. Yep. <clears throat> Hey, hey, I'd so, love to get a, a quote of my house. I, I live at 7921 Big View Drive here. Um, so what I would, I would tell you that you are over our threshold for a virtual, a virtual estimate and we're gonna have to send somebody out. Our, we generally leave our virtual estimates on houses 6,500 square feet or below mm -hmm. um, and two stories and below. The fact that you have a three story roof line and you're over 6,500 square feet is gonna trigger an in-person estimate. And I can get one scheduled for you Tuesday at one o'clock and you don't need to be present for us to do it as long as you're okay with us walking around the perimeter of your home. Cool. Yeah, yeah. so that's a, that's a good line. Uh, that was one of the things that we shared, which was like, know your limitations. This is obviously like your limit to where you start involving a whole bunch of custom stuff. Right. So Zach, we actually have a good question for you. Now that you've shown us how you do <laughs> your, the different types of virtual estimates, uh, do you charge or collect a deposit during the virtual estimate? What's your, what's your process there? No, not at all. We, we do not. Um, we don't do, um, the idea has been thrown around. Um, we do not at this time. I'm not gonna say that we never will. We definitely don't charge for estimates. Um, the concept would be a deposit at the time they wanted to schedule. Um, that we have the, the concept that we've talked about is a deposit at the time of scheduling. At this point, though, the answer is no, we do not. Um, we're a window cleaning, gutter cleaning company. Our average ticket, excuse me, um, is is low enough that it. I would I would rather risk not get, I would I would rather risk not getting paid than alienating people for trying to pull a deposit. Mm hmm. Fair enough. Yeah, I think there's definitely some cases um, for people that are doing other kinds of jobs, especially if there's going to be uh, material involved, um, installing something, in which case I would always say it's very, um, it's very honest to say, hey, no problem, Zach, we can go ahead and get this fixed for you just so you know it's going to require X, Y, and Z part. I'm going to need to deposit in advance to buy the, buy the parts. Um, and that's something you should never be afraid to ask for because if any time you're outlaying cash before you get there is definitely um, something you should be thinking about. Obviously with like that big home, if you have to rent like a lift, you know, you might even oh, tell yeah. the homeowner, hey, you know what? It's going to cost us 1500 bucks to rent the lift. Um, we're out that money regardless. So if you want to get this going, uh, we're definitely going to have to get this in advance of, of completing the project. Um, so anything that might even take a little bit longer than normal, um, don't feel bad asking for a deposit. It's really easy with House Ball Pro. You can just create um, whatever the job would be, and then you can set the price or you can click the deposit button and then send it to the homeowner, get them to pay, and you can see that they paid in real time um, if you're going to be doing that. So um, now, I will depends say, on your price. With a house like that, like that one we were just looking at, that, that huge one, 
that would generally, we would consider that a commercial job, whether people live in that house or not. And for commercial jobs, we do take deposits. Um, for commercial jobs, depending on the scope, we actually have contracts written up. Um, and for that particular house, we we're going to spend about $3,500 on a lift. And that would absolutely be in the contract that that would be paid up front. Um, mm -hmm. Residential service is we do not take. So, so let me clarify, please. Um, commercial is a little bit different and that house would generally fall under commercial. I don't care if you're living in it or not. A 7,000, a three story, 7,000 square foot building is generally, it's just a commercial building. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. That makes total sense. Um, when you're starting the conversation, um, have you ever gone and done a, um, a walkthrough where the customer is holding their phone up and you're FaceTiming through it? Or are you always doing it um, this way via um, um, satellite? Because I know not all areas have it and not all homes have mm -hmm. um, Zillow addresses for you to, to kind of sneak peek there. So walk me through how that process kind of works. Right. So we have done... Um, I don't know. I have not done one for a roof wash, but I have done the kind of the FaceTime and, and we've used a few different, I, everybody keeps asking in the comments, I see them asking over and over, like what software do you use? And it doesn't matter. Um, we've done them FaceTime. I've done them. Um, we have, we actually, I've used Zoom. We use GoToMeeting now. Um, I mean, it's all, it doesn't matter, right? It's all just video. However, mm -hmm. you can get that done. A simple way to get that done is, is completely fine. Um, we've done, we do also do fence and deck restoration, like wooden decks and, and fence um, staining and restoration. Um, we have done the video walk around for that type of job. I, I do not, I'm going to be honest. I don't think we've ever done one for a roof wash. Um, I just don't think we have, I, we could. Yeah. You've got that system pretty well nailed down. Yeah. yeah. In, in my market in Austin, again, if you're, if you're in a more rural market, you're going to start running into a lot, a lot more areas that you don't have like great satellite imagery, but in Austin, Texas, that's, it's just honestly not a thing. I mean, it's not going to be a thing in San Diego. It's not really a thing in Austin once every once in a while we run into what is becoming a not a problem but something to keep in mind in our market and i'm sure it is in others as well is there are times that we pull up zillow and it's like an 800 square foot little cottage in, a, in but it's in a neighborhood that you know is they're all being torn down and rebuilt as mcmansions um and so we have accidentally i'm not gonna lie like it has gotten through the cracks like we have sent people a quote for an 800 square foot house and we have shown up and it's been like 4500 square feet and so at that point, though, again, right, that all comes back down to just being up front with them and saying, hey, look, this is, we told you at the time that this was done, that this is based on the size of your home. And you know that this is not an 800 square foot home. And we actually had a guy laugh and say, yeah, I was wondering when you guys were going to catch that. Mm. So, so we, we repriced it on the spot. We did the job. He had no issue with it. It hasn't happened many times. It's happened once or twice. Um, but again, it's just, it's just communication, right? If you show up and you quoted the place because he had one air conditioning unit and you show up and there's a row of seven of them behind the house. That guy knows he doesn't have one air conditioning unit. You know yeah, what I, mean? I think in, in general, people are, are um, not looking to take advantage, you know, no. and we'll definitely know that it doesn't sound right. Yeah. You know, a hundred, a hundred and twenty dollars to clean, to clean windows in 4,500 square foot, three story house. Like everybody knows that's not real. Um, yeah. It goes back to, you know, if, that, if, that's, if they really think you're going to do it for that, it's probably just better off to, to walk away from that job. Totally. Yeah. So that makes sense. Yeah, this was super helpful. Um, anyone who didn't get to see this live, please go back and watch it. There's a lot of really good nuggets of information. Um, Mel, if you're still here, come back on and we'll go through and answer a couple of our Q&A questions before wrapping up for the night. Um, there she is. <laughs> so, um, Let's talk about one that pertains to this uh, topic. Um, will this, in, so a question from a lot of our pros, how will this work for my in industry? Let's say like HVAC or electrical, will it work for service and installs? Can we talk a bit about how it would work for other industries, virtual estimates? Yeah, I mean, I, I would just say a lot of the things that Zach's using uh, in the tools are no different than any of the tools any of the other um, types of companies can use. The one um, thing that he kind of talked quickly about, but actually is key to making this work, is looking at previous data to understand when you're, where your mins and your maxes are, and actually doing a, what's called a distribution curve and understanding where your standard deviations are, so you can fall within an acceptable average, so you're, you're making sure that you're actually quoting um, correctly. Um, a lot of this um, gets alleviated by uh, thinking through flat rate pricing, which really is just um, 
a uh, fancy way for saying there is amount of labor hours and there's some fixed material costs and you know what kind of labor hours you're going to spend on typical things and you know the margin that you want to make on the labor hours and when you multiply it all together and then sum it all up at the end you got one price um so walking through that exercise um if you've been in that trade for a while you can probably start to think yeah typical capacitor you know an hour and a half typical install four labor hours two guys eight labor hours my billable hour rate $150 and really quickly you can get to that flat rate pricing. So everything that you've seen Zach do here isn't just particular to, to window cleaning, roof washing, um, you know, the, the, the restoration of, 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 of the, the decks and those things. This, this works across all industries and you can start quoting in this way. Uh, and I think customers will really like it when you can start getting pretty accurate with your pricing here, not having too huge of a spread. In fact, if you can just say one price uh, for something that's fairly normal, then that's great. Um, think about things also that are fairly simple. So, you know, a simple unclog the toilet, as long as you don't have to snake it all the way down to the road, it's gonna be, you know, 150 bucks. You know, flat rate faucet install, unless it's some crazy contraption faucet, you know, 100 bucks. Mm -hmm. You know, start pricing those in there because um, the fact of the matter is you wanna get in that customer's home so you can establish that trust so if there's anything else, they're going to book you while you're there for all the other things that your business can do. So the easier you make it on the customer, the easier you're going to make it for yourself to make money once you're in that customer's home to do the other things that they also need to get done. I don't know if you if have I any insight there, Zach. One, sorry, if I can just add one mm -hmm. thing to that, Roland, is I've worked with a bunch of different industries, like in business coaching um, for our local chamber of commerce here in Austin. And one thing that I have found over and over and over is that people that have been in service industries for a long time, they know before they get out of the truck what that job is going to cost. They just have a problem explaining how they know. So if you really just sit down and you think about how you get, like I've been with so many people and they have gotten out, they're gonna be like, we haven't even seen the air conditioning unit yet. And they know what's wrong and they know how much it's gonna cost. But I, it takes us two hours of unpacking that for them to realize how they're coming up with that price. And it's exactly what you were just saying but you really have to think through your process and you have to be honest with yourself. And, and it's not a gut reaction. It's a, you're pricing it based on your experience and you need to be able to unpack that experience and break down where you're coming up with that price. Because I have been in the trucks with, with people that driving around, just kind of seeing how they work that know exactly what it's going to cost, but can't explain to me why they know that. Awesome. And then um, Mel, a question for you. This was our most top upvoted one. Uh, can, this goes back to uh, your evening update. Can self-employed um, self get unemployment? Great, yeah, and I just, um, in, in the q and I just posted a link um, with some, some information there. So not typically, right? But this is not a typical situation. So what I think we're all hoping for with this Senate bill, and I posted a, a link to an article, um, what we're hearing is that this bill calls for some new unemployment assistance to provide benefits for people who have lost their jobs, people who have lost hours, um, people who can't work because they're caring for someone impacted by the coronavirus. But also we've, we've seen that this could include independent contractors and the self-employed who typically are not eligible for unemployment. So I think the safest thing is until this thing passes the Senate and then the House and gets signed into law, we just don't know. But it's at least something right now that is currently um, been part of the conversation, especially with all the gig economy workers that we have these days, you know, folks who, who, you know, who do driving and things where they're not, they're not employee companies, but they, they work a pretty regular set of hours that are now being impacted by all the social distancing and stay at home orders. So mm -hmm. we can look yeah. to see what's to come. I would just say another thing to think about um, if you're incorporated as like a C corp or an S corp and you're paying yourself out of salary, um, then there are some options there for you. Um, but if you are not, it's much harder if you're, um, you know, maybe LLC, self-employed, um, sole proprietor. So depending on the way that you set up your business as well, it would make it easier or harder to apply for these kind of unemployment benefits. But that, talk to your local CPA. I'm not a CPA, <laughs> but that's, that's you're my- You're not, Colin. <laughs> um, yeah. And then one last question to wrap us up. Zach, this is for you. And Roland, if you have any ideas, um, so how do you promote these online virtual estimate scheduling? Do you do it on your website, on phone calls? What kind of advertising and marketing do you do around the virtual estimates that you offer? I don't. 
Um, the real quick answer for that is I don't. Um, the reason is because it has, this is not right. I've been doing this for three and a half, three years. Um, this is not a coronavirus thing for me, for us. This is the way we price jobs. Um, so when you call us or you get on our website or you send us any type of, you send us any type of price request, this is how your job is going to get priced. We don't give people the option. I mean, this is, you want your windows cleaned, here's your price. Um, if they ask us how we came up with it, we explain it to them. We have a process um, mm -hmm. that's repeatable that everyone understands. Um, and it's really a very, very simple process. Um, so we can explain it to them, but we don't, we've, right, this has just been the way we've been doing it since 2017. Um, so it's not a thing that we promote and it's, it's still not, I mean, this is just our method. Yeah. And I would say for pros that haven't done this and, and aren't as uh, avant-garde is the right word, but I'm kind of ahead of your time a little bit with this. Um, you know, this is a very simple thing that you can add to your website and just say, you know, next to your online booking link, say, hey, we also do virtual estimates or create it in your online booking thing as a tile that says a virtual estimate, you know, and then you can also do place a service call. Um, some pros, they charge for service calls. So maybe what you do is you go a free virtual estimate or we can come to your home for $70 you know you can start directing traffic that way because you're not incurring as many costs you can maybe do it for free um and get that hook um sunk in a little bit deeper with that customer because once you've got them on the phone you know they're not talking to anybody else and now this is your deal to lose so um don't be afraid to put those two things side by side um because people understand there's costs involved with rolling the truck out to the home and sending someone out there to go spend 30 minutes i mean that's an hour of someone's time let's say you pay them 30 bucks plus gas and everything you're in it for 60 70 bucks and that's that's break even cost. So um, people would understand this. So don't be afraid to put this on your website if this is something that's also new for you, um, especially if it's not typical for your industry. You don't see your competitors doing a lot of it. It's probably a cool thing to say like, hey, we've got this now, right? We, we do virtual estimates now and tie that into a Facebook ad unit tie that into uh, whatever you're posting on social. Um, there are also really cool things to talk about. Um, I've seen some pros get really clever on the, their Facebook pages and actually show the way that they do that virtual estimate um, as, a, as, a, as a promotion for it. So um, there's a lot of ways to kind of get that news out, but don't be afraid to tell the customers for sure, especially if it's something new. Um, and if you're lucky enough to this is just how you operate all the time, then it instills even more confidence in the customers. We're like, coronavirus or not, this is just how we do it. Oh, oh okay, this is, all right, then this is what we're doing. You know, <laughs> there's no option, uh, which right. is a really, really great um, sales approach too, because this is just how we do it. And here's the price, either you take it or leave it and you eliminate the people that are hagglers and those things that try to negotiate on it. Um, or you get out there and then they're like, nah, I'm not gonna do it for 200. And you're like, oh, I'm not gonna move my truck now. I'm not gonna go send it. I'll, I guess I'll take 200 or nothing. So this eliminates a lot of those things. Mm -hmm. And then Zach, just leaving us with some final thoughts before we sign off for the night from this evening update. Any last pieces of advice to pros who are gonna start offering virtual estimates? Um, yeah, so my, my biggest piece of advice is just because this isn't the way you've always done it doesn't mean this can't be another and or better way. Um, so many people that I work with are incredibly incredibly, I don't want to say afraid, but hesitant to change and just lean forward, embrace the change. It's now required, right? You could have started doing this before you didn't for whatever reason, but now you really kind of have to, because I don't know if you guys have really looked at them, but all of these orders, like I've got, we're in like 200 counties, right? And half of them are now covered by stay at home orders. So one thing you'll find is a lot of critical trades can be highlighted in these and you're still allowed to work but nowhere in here does it say sales calls, right? Sales calls is not an essential function for a critical trade in most of the stay at home orders, which is just one more incentive to start doing virtual estimates. Stop rolling your trucks, stop putting wear and tear on your people, stop putting your people into harm's way with this whole Corona thing, do it virtually. Like the, the hesitance to change is probably yours more than it's the customers and more than it's the market. Online pricing, online purchasing has been accepted by just about everyone. I think most people that I work with that have it, that don't want to offer this for their company are the ones that are getting online and putting in their credit card and getting all of their services that they, that they buy are virtual, but they don't want to offer them virtually. Yeah. So you please embrace it. You, you and your company will thank you for it later. 
Absolutely. I mean, great I advice. that ends up, that ends us on a great note. Zach, thank you so much for taking the time to teach yeah. all of us how you do your virtual estimates and how you see success with them. Um, for everyone who is watching tonight, we have the whole blog post for you already ready. So I'm going to throw that in our um, in our chat box here. And then on Facebook, we'll also throw it in the um, the live feed and we'll post it in uh, in its own post on Facebook too. So um, moral of the story, start doing virtual estimates. It's the way of the world now. Get ahead of the game, get ahead of your competitors. and. Other than that, we will see you back here tomorrow at 5 p.m. Pacific time for your evening update and your daily topic and deep dive. So we'll see everyone then. Bye, guys. Perfect. Bye, guys. Bye.